Good evening and welcome to Evening Prayer for Monday, August 31st. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun and we look to the evening light. We sing to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty, grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us, that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. O mountain of God, mountain of Bashan, O many-peaked mountain, mountain of Bashan, why do you look with hatred, O many-peaked mountain, at the mount that God desired for his abode, yes, where the Lord will dwell forever? The chariots of God are twice ten thousand, thousands upon thousands. The Lord is among them. Sinai is now in the sanctuary. You ascended on high, leading a host of captives in your train and receiving gifts among men, even among the rebellious, that the Lord God may dwell there. Blessed be the Lord who daily bears us up. God is our salvation. Our God is a God of salvation, and to God the Lord bring deliverances from death. Our New Testament reading tonight is from 2 Corinthians 9. Now it is superfluous for me to write to you about the ministry for the saints, for I know your readiness, of which I boast about you to the people of Macedonia, saying that Achaia has already since last year, and your zeal has stirred up most of them. But I am sending the brothers so that our boasting about you may not prove empty in this matter, so that you may be ready, as I said you would be. Otherwise, if some Macedonians come with me and find that you are not ready, we would be humiliated, to say nothing of you, for being so confident. So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to go on ahead to you and arrange in advance for the gift you have promised, so that it may be ready as a willing gift, not an exaction. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission flowing from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others. While they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you, thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. And our Book of Concord reading tonight is our second installment of Article 5 of the Apology of the Augsburg Confession called Love and Fulfilling the Law, which is a long article about good works and sanctification beginning in paragraph 38. No one can keep the law perfectly. Now let us reply to the objection stated above. The adversaries are right in thinking that love is the fulfilling of the law and that obedience to the law is certainly righteousness. But they make a mistake in this matter. They think that we are justified by the law. Since we are not justified by the law, we receive forgiveness of sins and reconciliation through faith for Christ's sake. This is not because of love or the fulfilling of the law. It follows, necessarily, that we are justified through faith in Christ. In the second place, this fulfilling of the law or obedience toward the law is indeed righteousness when it is complete, but it is small and impure in us. 
So our righteousness is not pleasing for its own sake and is not accepted for its own sake. From what has been said above, it is clear that justification means not the beginning of the renewal, but the reconciliation by which we are accepted afterward. It can now be seen much more clearly that starting to fulfill the law does not justify because such fulfillment is only accepted on account of faith. Nor must we trust that we are accounted righteous before God by our own perfection and fulfilling of the law, but rather for Christ's sake. In the third place, Christ does not stop being our mediator after we have been renewed. They err who imagine that he is merited only a first grace and that afterward we please God and merit eternal life by our fulfilling of the law. Christ remains mediator, and we should always be confident that for his sake we have a reconciled God, even though we are unworthy. Paul clearly teaches this when he says, I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted, 1 Corinthians 4.4. Paul knows that through faith he is counted righteous for Christ's sake, according to the passage, Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, Psalm 32.1, see also Romans 4.7. But this forgiveness is always received through faith. Likewise, the credit for the righteousness of the gospel comes from the promise. Therefore, it is always received through faith. It must always be regarded as certain that we are counted righteous through faith for Christ's sake. If the regenerate afterward think that they will be accepted because of the fulfilling of the law, when would a conscience be certain that it pleased God? We never satisfy the law. So we must always run back to the promise. Our infirmity must be recognized in this matter. We must regard it as, a, as certain that we are counted righteous for the sake of Christ, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us, Romans 8.34. If anyone thinks that he is righteous and accepted because of his own fulfillment of the law and not because of Christ's promise, he dishonors this high priest. This cannot be understood. How could someone imagine that a person is righteous before God when Christ is excluded as the atoning sacrifice and mediator? In the fourth place, what need is there of a long discussion? All scripture, all the church, cries out that the law cannot be satisfied. Therefore, starting to fulfill the law does not please on its own account, but on account of faith in Christ. Otherwise, the law always accuses us. For who loves or fears God enough? Who has enough patience to bear the troubles brought by God? Who does not frequently doubt whether human affairs are ruled by God's counsel or by chance? Who does not frequently doubt whether he is heard by God? Who is not frequently enraged because the wicked enjoy a better life than the righteous? because the righteous are oppressed by the wicked. Who fulfills his own calling? Who loves his neighbor as himself? Who is not tempted by lust? Paul says, For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Romans 7.19 Likewise, I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Romans 7.25 here he openly declares that he serves the law of sin. David says in Psalm 143, 2, Enter not into judgment with your servant, for no one living is righteous before you. Here even God's servant prays for the removal of judgment. Likewise, blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. Psalm 32, 2. Therefore in our weakness, sin is always present, which could be charged against us. A little while after it says, Therefore let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you. Here he shows that even saints ought to seek forgiveness of sins. They are more than blind who do not realize that wicked desires in the flesh are sins, of which Paul says, For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. Galatians 5.17 The flesh distrusts God, trusts in present things, seeks human aid in trouble, even contrary to God's will. It flees from suffering, which it ought to bear because of God's commands. It doubts God's mercy, and so on. The Holy Spirit in our hearts fights against such tendencies in order to suppress and kill them, and to produce new spiritual motives. We will collect more testimonies below about this topic, although they are clearly everywhere, not only in the scriptures, but also in the Church Fathers. The Church Fathers and St. Paul affirm justification through faith. Augustine well says, All God's commandments are fulfilled when whatever is not done is forgiven. Therefore, he requires faith even in good works. He says this to show that we may believe we please God for Christ's sake, and even our works are not worthy and pleasing of themselves. 
Jerome against the Pelagians says, Then we are righteous when we confess that we are sinners, and that our righteousness stands not on our own merit, but in God's mercy. Therefore, when starting to fulfill the law, faith ought to be present, which certainly believes that we have a reconciled God for Christ's sake. For mercy cannot be received except through faith, as has been repeatedly said above. Paul says in Romans 3.31, Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. The law. Here is what we ought to understand. People regenerated through faith not only receive the Holy Spirit and have motives that agree with God's law, but we ought also to realize that they are far distant from God from the law's perfection. This point has the greatest importance by far, and we must add it to the argument also. We cannot conclude that we are counted righteous before God because of our fulfilling of the law. Justification must be sought elsewhere in order that the conscience may become peaceful. For we are not righteous before God as long as we flee from God's judgment and are angry with God. Therefore, we must conclude that we are counted righteous for Christ's sake, being reconciled through faith. This is not because of the law or our works. Because of faith, beginning to fulfill the law pleases God. Because of faith, there is no charge that we fulfill the law imperfectly, even though the sight of our impurity terrifies us. If justification is to be sought elsewhere, our love and works do not justify. Christ's death and satisfaction ought to be placed far above our purity, far above the law itself. This truth ought to be set before us so that we can be sure of this. We have a gracious God. Excuse me. Mm-hmm. We have a gracious God because of Christ's satisfaction and not because of our fulfilling the law. Paul teaches this in Galatians 3.13 when he says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. This means that the law condemns all people, but Christ, without sin, has borne the punishment of sin. He has been made a victim for us, and he has removed that right of the law to accuse and condemn those who believe in him. He himself is the atonement for them. For his sake they are now counted righteous. Since they are counted righteous, the law cannot accuse or condemn them, even though they have not actually satisfied the law. Paul writes the same way to the Colossians, You have been filled in him, Colossians 2.10. This is like saying, Although you are still far from the perfection of the law, the remnants of sin do not condemn you. For Christ's sake we have a sure and firm reconciliation, if you believe, even though sin dwells in your flesh. The promise should always be in sight. Because of his promise, God wishes to be gracious and to justify for Christ's sake, not because of the law or our works. In this promise, timid consciences should seek reconciliation and justification. By this promise, they should sustain themselves and be confident that they have a gracious God for Christ's sake, because of his promise. So works can never make a conscience peaceful. Only the promise can. If justification and peace of conscience must be sought in something other than love and works, then love and works do not justify this is true even though they are virtues and belong to the righteousness of the law insofar as they are a fulfilling of the law. Obedience to the law justifies by the righteousness of the law, if a person fulfills it. But imperfect righteousness of the law is not accepted by God unless it is accepted because of faith. So legal righteousness does not justify, that is, neither reconciles nor regenerates nor by itself makes us acceptable before God. From this it is clear that we are justified before God through faith alone. Through faith alone we receive forgiveness of sins and reconciliation, because reconciliation or justification is a matter promised for Christ's sake, not for the law's sake. Therefore it is received through faith alone, although, when the Holy Spirit is given, the fulfilling of the law follows. And we will continue with that tomorrow evening. Our next section of this article is the reply to the adversary's arguments, which is always interesting stuff. We now join together in the Apostles' Creed in the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, 
the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. O Lord, merciful and holy Bridegroom, we grieve the fall of your church. It is our fault that the beauty of your bride is no longer recognized. Therefore we pray you, give and increase in us faith, love, and hope in you. Root out of us all sins and vice, all strife, all disbelief, all error and heresy. Rebuke the erring, convert the unbelievers, bring the rebellious again to the unity of the Christian church, and show them the light of your truth. Protect our shepherd from all danger of body and soul. Bless all pastors and those who administer in the church and the building of your congregation. Grant them success in all things. Equip your whole church with the power and proof of the holy faith. Stand by your witnesses among the nations and further the course of your gospel in all the world. Fill all government with the fear of you and let their ruling serve to foster and preserve peace. Have mercy on our people and our country. Let the youth be brought up in discipline and in a right knowledge of you, so that they may recognize your law and the way of your salvation. Give constancy and loyalty to all pious teachers. Comfort all the troubled and sorrowful. Impart health of body and soul to the sick. Grant to all pregnant women, according to your mercy, a happy result in their childbearing. To the needy, give bodily and spiritually according to your good pleasure. Let those who travel be commended to the protection of your holy angels, and be a strong help to all who need you, for the sake of your holy wounds, O Jesus. Amen. O God, the source of all that is good, nourish us in every virtue and bring to completion every good intent, that we may grow in grace and bring forth the fruit of good works. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit are one God, now and forever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day, and I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night.